Welcome once again. Thank you for reading those scriptures. I, my hope is that we quite a, a lot of them, but the essence is that at least for those who might not be familiar with some um, aspects of the journey of Christ into Jerusalem and the purpose that even as we read this morning, perhaps you would have caught a summation of it. Um, continuing with our sermon series, Emmaus, a journey through the Bible. We've looked at three, I mean, in the past three weeks, we've looked at the creation for last week we did Israel, and this morning we'll be looking at God's redemption plan. And what we've tried to perhaps study is the fact that all of these are connected. It's not like God made a mistake one point, woke up and said, oh, what am I going to do? Man has sinned, man has fallen. Things have gone out of place. And so I need to put a plan in place. But right from the beginning, they're all connected. And the exercise has been to go throughout the scriptures to show how it all points to Christ. So last week we, we ended at a place where We'd come from looking at the fact that God had called a man, made the first humans, they had rebelled, lost their place, lost their authority, their dominion, the relationship that they had with God. They had lost everything, exiled from out of Eden. But then later on, the nations themselves would also rebel, and so they also would be spread across the earth. Yet God will take one family out of these nations, one family, one man will find favor. And the last word was that he was going to bless the nations through this man, through Abraham's family. So, Israel, descendants of Abraham, their role as royal priests, priests before God and priests of God, to the nations, to carry his presence, to demonstrate his goodness, so that through him, everybody will get to know what it means, what it looks like to walk with the God, not of the other nations, but the Lord God himself, Yahweh himself. And so, secondly, their role was also to deliver the Savior of the world. So God said, it is in your seed that the nations will be blessed. And that blessing is primarily a blessing of salvation. So Paul will say in Romans chapter 3, verse 2, that the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. It was what God had entrusted to them. They had a role to play. So that's where we ended off. That we now see that the promise that God made right from Genesis after man fell, that he was going to bring the seed of the woman who was going to crush the head of the serpent. That seed was now in place. Jesus was now in the picture after years, thousands of years of waiting. So turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Let's read from the verse 30. Luke chapter 1 from the verse 30. Jesus is the seed of the woman. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and be, will be called the Son of the Most High. So, just like Abraham found favor, just like Noah found favor, this young lady, Mary, found favor with God. When you find favor with God, God can burden you with the things that are on his heart, his own purpose. He, he can impregnate you with his, with his plans. That's to find favor with God that you can share the burden of God. So God locates her and she says, you're going to carry my burden. Just like the way he found Noah and began to give him instructions and said, this is what I want to do, you're going to carry this burden. He calls Abraham out and said, this is what I want to do through you. You're not going to be like the rest. You're going to carry my burden. So she found favor with God. He will be great and will be called the son of the Most High. So not the son of Mary, not the son of her husband, Joseph, but this is the seed of God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. 
It's a promise that they had been holding on to. We've looked at this. They've been holding and waiting for that king who would come. David rose up, and for a moment, there was a glimmer of hope. Under his reign, the kingdom expanded. Under his reign, they were mighty in military exploits. Under his reign, there was prosperity. So the people had hope. But even the best of their kings, their leaders, could never match up to the king of kings himself. So later on, you see in David's life how he will mess up significantly. But God was still holding on to that promise, or the nation was still holding on to the promise that God had given that a king will come who will sit on the stone forever. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. So key words to note. You see throne, you see king, you see kingdom. That's a king. That's the royal priest now who the first royal priest lost that. Now this one, he won't rule for a moment. He'll rule, for, he'll rule forever. There's a confidence that God has in this Adam, the second Adam who is going to come. Verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? Literally since I know no man. When God wants to impregnate you with what he has, you don't need to, in essence, you know, in a sense, know a man, whether intimately or in whichever way. It's to be intimate with God. That's how you get to carry what God has. I don't, I don't know a man. Verse 35, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of of God. He will be set apart. He will be the son of God. So this is the seed that we've been looking for. We finally tracked him. The angels have come to announce that what you guys have been waiting for, the promise that God made right from the beginning, that promise has been fulfilled. And the way that you begin to carry that which is divine is the spirit of the Lord comes upon you. And the power of the most high overshadows you. So for all of us who are, who are now children of God, who have been filled with the Spirit, who carry His power, you're not ordinary. Set apart to carry what is holy, set apart for God. So not like any other thing and not the demonstration or wanting or desiring to be like anybody else, but as you are set apart yourself, now, what comes off out of you is also set apart and it's named unto God. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. We're looking at Jesus, who is the seed of the woman who is going to crush the head of the serpent. That's God's redemptive plan. Matthew chapter 1, 20. It says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her, is from the Holy Spirit. It's not from man. Verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. His name will be Yeshua. If you want to know what he's going to do, it's right in his name. His name reveals what his assignment is. He's going to save his people from their sins. He might not necessarily come to save them from the military rule or the oppression that they were under, he might not necessarily come and satisfy all their wants and their needs, but he has primarily come to save his people from their sins. It's an assignment that only one person can do, and that person is Jesus Christ. He's not come as a genie, that when you rub him, you rub him in the right way, he will produce for you. When you... Get him on a good day, that's what he will give you. No, he has come to save his people from their sins. Can you say with me, he has come to save his people from their sins. We ought to understand what his assignment is. If we are going to know him, if we are going to follow him. It's the most important. And what this means is that Whatever the limitation was, whatever hindrance there was between us and God has been taken away. So now, we can be known as sons of God. We can have daily fellowship, communion, relationship, unhindered. 
with God. John 1, 29. The next day he saw Jesus, as he said concerning John the Baptist, he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the prophet who had been sent to also proclaim what his role will be, identified him and said, that is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In the, in the Old Testament, they had to atone for their sins with the blood of goats and lambs. But said, no, this one, he's not only just going to take away the sin of even Israel so that we can commune with God in the tabernacle or in the temple, but he's taking away the sin of the world. Luke chapter 19 from this verse 10 to 11. He's taking away the sin of the world. So the promise that God made to Abraham, what he's saying is the promise has been fulfilled. Because he said to Abraham, in your seed, in you, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. You will be a blessing to the nations. You will be a blessing to all people. So finally, that promise is now being realized. Amen. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He said, I'm not going to only save those who are near me. I am going to seek you out. I am going to pursue you. That's the beauty of that which Christ has done for us. No man, I've said this quite a number of times, that no man in himself seeks God. When, listen, when you thought that you accepted a call to salvation, no, God was the one who sought you out. When we were dead in our sins, Christ died for us. He died for the ungodly. Nobody seeks God. No man. Man by himself will want to satisfy his own desires to do his own thing. But unless God seeks man out, man is going to go the way of death and damnation. And so, when we reflect, we meditate on like a season like this, we are thinking, okay, it's Easter. These are the, some of the considerations. How you would have gone your own way and done your own thing if God had not sought you out. So the promise has been fulfilled. The, the package has been delivered. The seed of the woman. It's not a seed of the man. The spirit of the Lord came upon Mary, and she would birth the Messiah, the Savior, who is going to destroy, is going to take out the one who has been the primary engineer of the rebellion, man's rebellion against God. Because fundamentally, that is one of our greatest, if not our greatest sin, that all men have rebelled against God. And God said, no. This won't continue forever. The pain, the destruction, the disgrace, all the negative things that turning away from God has brought into the world, God said, I'm going to judge it. And the, the beauty again is that God delivered on his promise. How many of you are happy that God delivered on his promise? So we're going to take a, a little deep dive into how Jesus crushes the head of the serpent. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4 from the verse, from the verse 1. It will interest you to note that he began to tackle this right from at the beginning of his assignment. Then Jesus went, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Why is he being led by the Spirit? Yeah. The previous verse, he had been baptized and the Spirit of the Lord had come upon him. So now, the Spirit of the Lord himself, God himself is leading him into the wilderness to be tempted. Or another word you can use, in fact they are used interchangeably, is, is to be tested by the devil. Adam and Eve had their own test. Can I 
announce to you that if you are a child of God, you're a follower of God, you will be tested. Your faith will be tested. What you claim to believe will be tested. The enemy has the right to do that. You said you are a child of God, you believe, you trust God. The very next thing, in fact, God is going to lead you to him and say, check him out. Check out this package, that I, this new package that I got. And he's going to come and scan you and say, is this person really of faith? And God is going to allow him. So Jesus is led. It's not, this, you see, not, every, not everything that you go through is necessarily engineered by the devil. Now, C.S. Lewis said, um, the film writer, he said that even the devil is God's devil. And what he's saying is that God allows him, even when he thinks he's being smart, God will allow him. I said, okay, you go ahead. Let's see how far you can go. So, the Lord will allow him to check you out. And every child of God must know and be ready for that time of reckoning. And for some of you, maybe the test have taken, has taken place already. It's not a test that you just go through one time. Just like in, in you're going through school, you don't get tested one time. Like, okay, I took the entrance exam and that's it. No, you will be tested in first grade. Before you graduate, you'll be tested again. So the test will come so that you can, it's not to frustrate you, but it's so that you can graduate, you can progress. And God will allow it because just like any good teacher who will have a, a challenge if there was a student who was constantly repeating their class or staying in their class and not advancing. God does not want you to stay in, the, in one class. He wants you to advance. So you must take that test. Just like Adam was tested. Just like Christ was tested. The enemy will come and test. So he takes, Jesus begins to take him on right at the beginning of his assignment. He's tested in the wilderness. Because this is what God said would happen. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. He said, he is going to crush the head of the serpent. And so this is not him. He's not chancing upon this situation. But it's, it's being engineered by the Holy Spirit. And it's leading him into that place. To tackle him head on. This is possibly the greatest battle of man. Of mankind ever. Up until this point. This was probably the greatest battle of mankind. So this was, this was an important and a critical match. And if he fails, mankind is in trouble. Because the first one failed already. If this one fails, there's going to be a lot of trouble. So let's read Matthew verse 2. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. What Jesus is doing here is, he's reliving Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and Genesis 3 all over again. What are the first words that come to, out of the tempter? If you are the son of God. Now, just the previous verse, God had just announced Jesus and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. pleased. And the very next thing the enemy comes, he comes to tackle that very proclamation that God said. What were the first words that came when he came to the woman? Did God really say, You should not eat. He will question the very word that you are holding on to. The very words of God, he will question. That's why when we talk about believers having a relationship with the word of God, it's not just head knowledge, but having that intimate desire and knowledge of the word of God. That it's not here, in, just in your head, but it's deep in your soul, deep in your heart. That word have I hidden it? 
my heart that I will not sin against you. The word must be so one. Your words were found by me and I ate them and they were to me the joy and the rejoicing of my soul. The word must take root and he is going to come question. The very same thing that God has said concerning you. But look at the way Jesus tackles this problem. Now, I just said that this is probably the greatest battle and the most critical of mankind up to this point. Now, when you are going to face, when humans are going for, um, let's say it's the World Cup final, and you are preparing for the final, how will you prepare? You're a boxer. There's a world championship match. How will you prepare? Will you starve yourself? You be on a good diet, you exercise, you sleep well, you be on a strict regiment. Jesus starves himself. Follow me carefully. He's going to tackle the enemy. And he's starving himself for 40 days. If you go beyond 40 days, you're likely, on, on this kind of fast, you, you're not making it. It's 40 days is the limit for a human body. So what is not happening is that he's not just hungry, he's dying. His body is withering. He's dying here. So the way Jesus tackles his, the greatest battle of his life is he empties himself of all his physical strength. Of all his, his own strength, he empties himself. He says, I'm not going to rely on my own strength so that he can fully access the power of God. He can fully access the strength of God. And what he's demonstrating here to you and I is how you take on the enemy. You will fall, you know, face down, total disgrace, and defeat if you try to rely on your own strength. You can't take him on with your own strength. God has to supply you with that strength. God has to supply you with that power. And that's what Jesus does. He does not maximize his own strength like humans, every human would do. Have we ever seen a man like this before? Up until this point, have we ever seen if we look across, we look back to all their kings. We look back to all their leaders. Has there ever been one like this before? No. Not one who will fully rely on God. Not one who will fully trust in him. Remember, that has always been the issue. Right from the beginning, the words that the Lord gives them, the instruction that he gives them, the issue is, are you going to trust me? Are you going to hold on? To my words, are you going to believe that I've got your best interest at heart? That's what the, what, that's what the test was about. If you've ever wondered whether, I mean, the, in the Garden of Eden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, what is it about? So are you going to trust me to determine what is good and what is bad for you? As a human being, you don't have that ability. You don't have that in yourself. You don't, are you going to let me tell you what is good and what is bad? Are you going to trust me? Are you going to receive life from me to be able to embark on this journey? Or are you going to do things your own way? And up until this point, there had been no human being who had ever fully trusted God. Jesus comes right on the scene and he, he empties himself. He said, I'm going to rely on you fully. I'm going to trust you fully. That is how to walk with God. And when you walk with God in that way, you are always victorious. The enemy cannot have a hold on you because you have emptied himself. Later on, he keeps saying, it's a, it's a principle, biblical principle, and it's very countercultural. It's, 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 it's not what other religions teach. It's not what even many even understand about Christianity. That is primarily, it's about you dying to self. You die so you can live. And so here he's dying so that he can, he can live. He can triumph. Whoever will come after me, he must pick up his cross and follow me. He says, you want to come with me? 
Okay, we are going to die. Are you willing? The way to ascend is we, you're going to die. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides by itself. If you want to, however, if the grain is going to come out and be fruitful and produce much more seed, it needs to go in the ground. Are you willing to die? Are you willing to lean on God, rely on him wholly, fully, for his power? So he begins to make him offers. And he says to him, you know, listen, he's brought you here to kill you. That's what, that's what the tempter is saying. You're going to use your sanctified imagination. He's brought you here to kill you. You're going to die. The way you're going, you're going to die. Listen, I, I want your best interest. And here's what you can do if you want to live. You've got a power. Maybe you don't know how to harness it. You've got a power. Let me tell you. Just turn these stones into bread. I am offering. He wants to kill you. I am offering you life. Pick up these stones. Turn them. He's pushing him. He's saying to him, Listen, 40 days, it's not easy. Grumble, grumble a little bit. It's, it's okay. You are in pain, you are in shame. Why don't you just grumble? Do you remember a group of people who walked around in the wilderness for 40 years and they grumbled because they could not get bread to eat? They're saying, no, why don't you grumble a little? It's okay. You're a man, you're frustrated, grumble. So he's pushing him. He's pushing him. And how does Jesus tackle this? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. As if, my friend, I know what you're doing. We don't just live by, by bread, by natural means. I'm more than just flesh. <laughs> I feed on what God is saying. That's what, God's, that's what God's word means to me. It's life. It's very, the very essence of life in itself. It's not a suggestion that I'm going to throw away like the first Adam, or the first humans, but this is what I live by. Not what you're offering me. You see, he's giving us a pattern. The same way Jesus overcame by the word is how you overcome. Taking the word. He's quoting here from Deuteronomy. So Moses wrote it. Jesus came, was captured, he came, and he overcame the enemy by it. How are you going to overcome the temptations? The testing of the enemy. Is it going to be by ideas, philosophical thoughts, by good, you know, just willing and wishing and having a strong will? Being very determined, being very principled. Is that how you're going to overcome? No. The same way that he overcame, by the very word of God. So you can contrast his life with Adam and Eve, royal priests who failed, and he overcame. You can contrast his life with Moses, who went up in the cloud for 40 days, 40 nights, came down, and he saw. The confusion, the way the people had mounted up golden calf and were going about it, he saw it and he got angry. But Jesus did not fail. He maintained his posture. So the second part of what is going on here, let's go to the next verse. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Say to him, listen. To keep this path, you need to keep trusting him. But listen, how do you know that he's, really, he's going to come through for you? How do you know? If you keep going that way, there might be a greater test. How do you know that he was going to come? Why don't you test him now? 
test, just test him. And if he comes through for you, then you know that eventually you will actually come through for you. So test him. You see, these are the, the enemy doesn't have anything else in his playbook. The same tricks all over again. The same playbook. He, he keeps playing. For each and every one of us, he comes with the same trick. You trust God? You trust God for your future? You trust God for marriage? You trust God for... Why don't you give in now? If you go through, you, you know that he'll come through for you. That just, just give in now. Why don't you go your own way now? He doesn't have anything in his playbook. When you know what is going to come before you, you know how to prepare. You are even able to identify the tricks of the enemy, the lies of the enemy. You know that thought is not from you. That thought is not from God. It's right from the pit of hell. So Jesus responds and says to him in the verse 7, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the... I'm not going to test him. I don't need to do that. I trust in his word. I trust in what he said concerning me. In the assignment that I have, I don't need to test God. Next verse. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. The world has got its glory. That's what people don't understand. People don't know. You think it is only, uh, it is only disgrace and rubbish that is in the world. No, the world has got some glory. Don't you see how sometimes the music is very nice? Like the shows are so, the movies. Oh, I mean, you're talking about technology and, you know, it's like the state of the art. The world has got its glory. And that's what he says to him. He says, it took him very high. He showed him in an instance all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. Because Adam had given the keys to him. The authority had been handed. What was given to man Man gave to the enemy. So at this point, he had the, he had the authority. He said, all this belongs to me. And Jesus didn't, didn't tackle him. He didn't say it's not true. Because it was true. The kingdoms of the world. But when you, when you, when you trade your soul for the glory of the world, the glory of the world is passing. It's fleeting. It's fading. It's just like a, like a, a, fake, a fake bag. Or fake jeans, or fake any whatever, clothing, fake watches. When you, you handle the real thing, you're like, ah. That's what the glory of the world looks like. It's, it's, it's there, you see it, but it's fake. That's not the real thing. And so you use it for a while, and by the time you realize it is deteriorating. You can't use it, you can make some headway. The world has its glory. And the, the enemy will keep offering to everybody, even to Christians, and say, will you take it? It's an offer. The fame is an offer. It got, you've got a price to pay, though. He says, next verse. This is the price to pay. He, he said to him, if you fall down and worship me, that's the price. You fall down and Worship me. So there is a price to pay if you want the glory of the world. And it's to give your soul. It's to give your worship. You can't worship, you can't be a worshiper of God and be a follower of the world. You can't be a worshiper of God and be one who delights in the things, in the glory of the world. You enjoy it so much. You don't have any problem, any comes with it at all. In fact, many times we've come to believe that holiness and the world are compatible. Oh, you can give to God on a Sunday, give to him what he wants. And then on other days, you can do whatever you want. We've come to think that they are compatible. No, 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 no. You can only bow down to one God. What price are you willing to pay for your soul? Next verse. Verse 10. And he said to him, all this I will give up if you fall and worship it. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Now, I will need to end this particular segment of this. And, and please, I want you to get this. Jesus knows when is enough. 
Many of us don't know how to warfare. You keep hearing the voice of the enemy, and it's like, you now he, he begins to, it's like a, like a bad friend or a bad influence. You have bad, you know, bad friends. You know that friend is not good, but you keep calling them, you keep having conversations, you keep having WhatsApp chats. You, you know that the, what the person is saying is nonsense. But you keep engaging them. You keep listening. You keep, I don't know whether it's the conversation you want or the company. Or, but you keep. That's what many of us do with the devil. It's like we are just entertaining him. Jesus knows when it's enough. He says, hey, enough. We've had enough of this. When the enemy is speaking his lies, you need to know when to say enough. Stand on the word of the, of, of the authority of the scriptures. But at some point you need to say, get thee behind me, Satan. No more. I am a sheep of the Lord. I hear his voice. I'm not wired to. I said that to the enemy a long time ago. Those were times where thoughts will flood. My head. One day I just woke up and said, I said, never speak to me again. I don't want to hear a voice. Would that stop him? No, but it's, it stopped. It stopped. But what happened from that point was that every time when he would, sp- I knew that. No, 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 no. And sometimes I'll go on that path, whether it's even dreams or whatever it is. And after a while, I'll be like, <laughs> nah, I see what you're doing here. That's not, that's not. I remember earlier this year, my, 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 I was so bad in the woods. Even from whether it was dreams, it was whatever it was, I was so like, I'm like, what is this? And a couple of weeks later, I realized, no, I, I'm actually under some, is this some kind of attack? I, if you don't realize that, he will keep, he'll take you on a journey. He will keep taking you. Jesus said, no more. And after he did that, what happened? He said, be gone. He left him. Other versions would say, for a little while, or to come back at an opportune time. That means that he will go and he will look for whether he can find an opportunity to come in again. So that's how he tackled him. Takes him on right at the beginning. The second part is, he lives on Jesus. So now, that's Jesus, the promise of God. This is how he's overcoming, what the, he's undoing what the enemy did. Second thing is, he's going to teach them how to be humans. So he's, he's going to live on the earth. He's going to walk in dominion. The, the life of Jesus is so beautiful in that, listen, he knew who, who he was. He did not live below that. Neither did he live above the reason why he was here. He knew who he was and he walked in exactly that fashion. Know who you are and walk in it. That is a way of walking in authority in walking in dominion. Philippians chapter 2. He's, he's pointing to himself and he said, listen, what the first guy did, and you people have been messing up since then, this is how you live as a human. So when you look at Jesus' life, he's saying, this is how you ought to live. That's why he said, Greater things than these will you do. This is how you ought to live. This is how you were meant to live the whole time. This is who you are supposed to be. One who is in constant relationship with God, knows who they are, they walk in authority, they walk in power. That's why I, for one, cannot understand why people think that Christians cannot walk in authority, cannot walk in power. Jesus is demonstrating that. If anything at all, we need to pursue. We need to inquire. And we need to ask questions. And we say, where are we missing it? What is it that you knew? What, is, what was revealed to you? How did you do this? Because Jesus emptied himself. Though he was God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself. That's what the preceding verses say. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on the cross. 
Jesus is saying, this is how you live as a human being. You obey. You walk in obedience with God. You walk in trust. You don't deviate. Believe him. Trust him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. Trust in him. You don't doubt. You don't question. You believe. Believe. Faith is to trust him. So what has, has he not said it? Will he not do it? Believe it. Hold on to that word and don't deviate. He said, that's how you live. And he's saying that. He said, listen, I am going to obey the Father even if it will cost my life. Oh, friends. How many of us have been tempted to the point of death? Have been tested to the point of death? A little affliction, a little trouble. It's like, this, even this Christianity thing, I don't even know what I'm getting from it. You got your soul. You got eternal life. You have a seat before God forever. It is not to just derive pleasure from this world. To, to satisfy this flesh. That you one day will fall to the earth. You can't take it anywhere. As you are aging, you begin to feel the pains. You begin to gray. Don't look at mine. That eternal life. He's giving him a place for that. So he said, I'm going to obey. I'm going to follow him. Even if I will die. Can you make this your resolve? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Satan will always offer to you what seems good. He listen, the enemy don't don't be fooled. That's where we, we miss it. We think that when he is going to offer you something, he's going to offer you poison. And you see it labeled clearly. This is poison. I'm always going to drink poison. Satan, you are tempting with, are you serious? I don't want to die. Even if I want to die, not a painful death like that. No, no, no. Nobody would take poison. But if he can mix it up, oh, a little good. How about a cocktail? A cocktail. Like if I, if I gave you and I said to you, this is this water, right? If I said to you, this is some, some juice. It's a lovely drink. But I'm going to put just, just a drop, drop of poison. It is primarily, mainly the whole thing. The whole thing here is juice. Tasty. Just a drop of poison. Why won't you have it? It's just a drop of poison. You think he will offer you what is clearly evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he's still offering it. And many are still drinking. Many are still eating. Many are still taking of it. He will not offer you anything that is just bad. So he's saying, this is how you live. He said, for humans, you are meant to rule. I'm going to go like, I'm going to do a big sweep, okay? So now when you begin to see him from Matthew chapter 5, when he begins to teach on the mountaintop, oh, it's the whole Moses again. It's how Moses was instructing the people. And now he's giving a new set of laws. You thought that if you are giving responsibility, dominion over the earth, it means that you are to rule over others and have dominion over them. No, 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 no. That's not what humans do. Humans have dominion. They lead by serving. So I did not come to serve, but I did not come to be served, but to serve. So that's how humans live. No, don't live as the people from the other nations do. If you have authority. So he turns the whole thing upside down. You taught a blessed life 
was X, Y, Z, all these benefits. But blessed are the peacemakers. I said, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the meek. This is the law of God. Now he's instructing the people all over again. He said, this is how you live. First John chapter 3, verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So he said, this is how you live, destroy the works of the devil. Wherever you go, you see injustice, destroy it. Who is going to do it? He said, that is how you live. Destroy it. That's, that's what you were meant to do. When you see sicknesses, do something about it. Whether it's setting up hospitals, lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. When you see strife, you see fighting, bring peace. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Wherever you go, this is how humans are supposed to live. Don't live as the, as the people of the world. This is how humans live. John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to kill, to steal and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Or have it more abundantly. So this is why I have come. This is my assignment. To destroy the works of the devil. I've come to give life. I've come to supply life. So wherever you go now, you supply life. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Let people drink from the fountains of life within you. That's why you, have to, you ought to be connected to the fountain of life. There's a river which streams to make glad the city of God. God is in her midst. God is in your midst. God is flowing from within you. Wherever you go, you gladden the people. You gladden the city. You gladden the atmosphere. This is how you ought to live. Destroy whatever is of the devil. Destroy demonic oppression. So that's why you go around and whenever you come across people who were oppressed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and he went about doing good. Healing all those who were oppressed, who were under the tyrannical rule of the enemy. Who were being subjugated, disgraced, living in shame. He says, now that assignment has been given to you. I said, 10 verse 38. That's your assignment. That's how you need to live. Dispense abundance of life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. For our sake he made him who knew, for our sake he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So now you are now the righteousness of God. Christ, as he's riding into Jerusalem, He's going to go high up on the mountain. The sin of the world is going to be placed on him. And on that cross, there's going to be a divine exchange. That exchange so that you will receive his righteousness. His righteousness will be given, imputed to you, credited into your account. Not, nothing that you did. Not that you were worth it. But you said, I trust in God. I trust in God. Lord, I trust in you for salvation. I believe in you for hope. I believe in you for life. I turn away from my sins. And I trust in you. I, I, I will live this life a life for you. He said, you are given a new life. And that life is a righteous life. So on the cross, he deals a lethal blow to the enemy. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. Colossians 2. He dies on the cross. And scripture says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him Having forgiven all our trespasses. How many of our trespasses, for those who have believed in Christ, how many of our trespasses have been forgiven? All. You have no right to continue to bear your trespasses and to recall that which God has forgiven. All of them, not some of them. Not the ones that you think are manageable. Not the ones that you think are not bad enough. You think, okay, these ones are okay. Maybe I stole, I used to steal feet. Uh, fish in my mother's uh, uh, pan, you know, when I was a child. Okay, I, okay, God, that one is a minor sin. God has forgiven that. You know, when I was fighting with somebody and I said some bad words to them, I said, okay, that's a minor sin. God has forgiven that. But this abortion thing, he can't forgive it. 
Have you confessed? Have you come before the cross? He said, he has cleansed, he has cancelled the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. Oh, time will not permit me. The legal demands, the, the punishment for that sin. He's paid a debt. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Where are us the sins of the believer? Nailed to the cross. Nailed to the cross. That's why now this cross is a, a, is a symbol of victory. It's a symbol of hope. Because all our shame, all our pain was placed on this one man, the God man, who alone could accomplish the forgiveness of the sin of mankind. It's been placed on him. So we are now free. That authority has now been given back to man. Are we going to the 15? Verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. It's like, I think one translation said, he marched them, he lined them up. The principalities and power, he lined them up through the streets. And they, they, look at them, they've been disgraced to Don't fear devil. Don't fear Satan. Don't fear the witch in your, your father's house. Look at them. I've, I've overcome them. For anybody, if you, so long as you've put your faith in him, that's what he has done. That's what he did. Let's read Exodus chapter 6 from verse 6 to 9. Say therefore to the people of Israel, because remember we are connecting the dots. This is what he's always meant to do, right from the very beginning. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. So the Lord was commissioning Moses with a message. He says, when you go to them, say to them, I am the Lord. How does, it, how does the story of redemption start? I am the Lord. It's not them. It is who I am. Because of who I am, I'm going to redeem them. And I will. When you keep reading, you see, I will, I will, I will, I will. Many people think the Old Testament is separate from the New. No, I keep telling you, it's one broad story. It's a two. You don't know how to handle it. So people tend to discard it. No. Same thing that he was doing. The shadow has now been made flesh. I will bring you out from under the burdens, the affliction. Of the Egyptians. This was what sin was doing. I said to you that now people feel like, okay, you know, when you're a child of God, he'll disturb you. There are things that you want to do, you will not do. Yes. Because you're a slave to righteousness. Now, if you don't want that, you can be a slave to the devil. That's also, that's your choice. If you don't want to be a slave to righteousness, you can be a slave to sin. But he's brought us out from the burdens of the Egyptians. He says, I will deliver you from slavery to them. It's a picture of redemption. I will deliver you from slavery. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. He said, I will go to the extreme, bringing them out of Egypt. Pharaoh was so hard-hearted. He was like, I will not let these people go. He said, okay, you not let them go? Let's, okay, let's go. And in 10 plagues, he demonstrated his power. Up until then, the world had not seen such power before. He demonstrated him. Brought down an entire economy. Brought down an entire nation. He said, for my people, I'll do anything. The Lord says he will war for you. You can call him a man of war for your sake. He said, he will die for you. For my people. I will do whatever it takes to bring them out. I will redeem them with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. Now, it's not just deliverance. It's not just salvation. But you become my people now. And I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. I want you to know. I want you to know me. I want you to have relationship with me. I want you to have fellowship with me. It's not a religious thing. It's not that you are saved and you, 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 you come to church and you go, to believe, you go through believer's class and then that's it. So no, you, you, I want, you, know, you know me. You know, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give Abraham to Isaac and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. The promise that he made to Abraham, he said, has been fulfilled. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses. 
because of the broken spirit and harsh slavery. Many times this is the situation. So burdened by the power of sin that even when hope comes, the good news comes, the gospel comes, we can't receive it. But this morning, I pray that there has been hope released into your heart. As you consider the reason why Christ rode into Jerusalem, he wasn't riding to go and celebrate and to be a feast to be laid before him. It was shame. It was disgrace. But he set his face like a flint for you and I. He did not turn back. He did not hold back for our sakes. And the story rise, starts right from the very beginning. A God who fulfills his promise to redeem all of his people. And that promise has been made. God is a promise keeper. You can bank on him. You can trust him. Hold on to his words. Live for him. I did not hold back anything from delivering my people. I don't hold myself back from you. Don't hold yourself back from me. He has rescued us. He has liberated us. He has loosed us. This morning, we are going to spend a few minutes to take communion as we reflect again on that great sacrifice. Thank you.